I want to welcome all members of the Georgetown University in Qatar community, but also members of the Education City community. I see a couple of uh, peers, a couple of deans from other universities, and also members of the uh, Qatar broader community. Um, on behalf of Georgetown University in Qatar, I welcome you, Malcolm, to the stage and to um, really thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, just a couple of words by way of introduction. Um, you know that the Jesuits um, who founded Georgetown University and scores of other colleges and universities have armed generations of students worldwide with one of the most precious and invaluable gifts that can be bestowed, an elite liberal arts education. Now, a liberal arts education takes us to be curious, teaches us to be curious, and skeptical. It teaches us to learn how to learn. It encourages us, with equal measures of humility and confidence, to admit that we don't know what we don't know, to yearn for greater understanding, and most importantly, to hunger for truth. Now, the Jesuits who founded this institution are uppercase C Catholics. But the legacy they have imparted to our students, who represent multiple faith traditions, is lower C Catholic, which the dictionary defines as an abiding interest in a wide variety of things, the propensity to be all-embracing. I can say without fear of contradiction that if lower case C Catholics have a saint, it's Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> he is an exemplar of liberal arts excellence because his greatest gift is his insatiable and positively infectious curiosity. He's the author of six New York Times bestsellers, The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, What the Dog Saw, David and Goliath, and Talking to Strangers. His latest book is The Bomber Mafia, A Dream, A Temptation, and the Longest Night of the Second World War. Malcolm has been named one of the 100 most influential people by Time Magazine, and one of the foreign policy's top global thinkers. He's host of the popular Revisionist History podcast, in which Malcolm explores the overlooked and the misunderstood. Every episode re-examines something from the past, an event, a person, an idea, even a song, and asks whether we got it right the first time, because, as you put it, sometimes the past deserves a second chance. Malcolm Gladwell has been a force in American and global culture and journalism for a quarter century. After graduating from the University of Toronto with a history degree, he moved to the US and began his career in journalism. In 1987, he began covering business and science for the Washington Post, where he worked until 1996. Now, if there was one book of Malcolm's, I'd encourage the students, this community is highly ambitious, high achieving students to read, it's Outliers, in which he poses the question, why are certain people exceptionally successful? In a personal elucidation of the 10,000 hour rule he popularized in his book, Malcolm admitted, I was a basket case at the beginning of my journalism career, parenthetically, and I felt like an expert at the end. It took 10 years, exactly that long. In the mid-1990s, Malcolm was hired by The New Yorker, where his story stood out as fresh and counterintuitive. His first book, The Tipping Point, first published by Little Brown in 2000, sold three million copies and spent eight years on bestseller lists. The rest, as they say, is history. Please join me in extending a warm Hoya welcome to Malcolm Gladwell. It's great to have you here, Malcolm. Thank you. Um, Malcolm and I will go into conversation, um, ask a few questions, we'll have some conversation, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, let's begin with a topic that you've just described at lunch as an unhealthy fascination with education, um, or obsession with education. Uh, you released a compendium of audio essays called The Myths of Meritocracy. 
in it, you take on everything from LSAT to, to student council elections and explore why we often reward the wrong people. Tell us more about this. Well, you know, I'm, it stems, part of my obsession stems with my, I'm not the only one, the kind of general observation that as human beings are really bad at making predictions, particularly about other human beings. Um, and it strikes me that once you, uh, I was, this is a random observation, I don't know how many people are basketball fans, but you know, if you look at the, every year in Las Vegas, they make odds about which basketball team is gonna do the best and which will do the worst. The success rate of uh, Las Vegas in predicting which team will do the worst in, uh, over the, the next season is about uh, 10%, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, the prediction about who will do the best is less than 50%. Again, not very good. Um, our predictions about people, not teams, and this is, but people are probably even more flawed. We don't like to own up to that, but we're bad at it. And yet we have built an a series of institutions, schools, which profess to be able to predict with reasonable accuracy which students are most likely to succeed and which are not. And I just don't buy it. I'm like, what, so elite institutions, elite colleges have somehow mastered the thing that the rest of society and mankind can't do? Um, you know, when do elite colleges ever attempt to empirically verify the accuracy of their admissions decisions? Never. Isn't that strange? Everyone else has to. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I have now gotten, I've now become such a kind of um, radical agnostic on this that I think that um, I really believe a lot in, and I've written about it, on, on, um, in lottery admissions. I just think you should establish a floor about, above which you think anyone could reasonably succeed at your school and let people in by lottery. It's the only, everything lottery. else is lottery. Yeah, put the names in the hat, pull out whatever, 1,500. <laughs> um, lottery with some measures of ensuring that you have the kind of diversity that uh, I know you're very fond so, of having. Yeah, well, no, no, so you would get it route. naturally, yeah. just have it randomly through. So to give, Harvard has what, 30,000 admissions in a given year. And if you look at the admissions pool, it's pretty powerfully self-selected, but they can very clearly establish a floor for what the pool should be. I think they should put all 30,000 names in a hat and just pull out 1,200 piece of paper. And just say you're in. And that, you know, it both, it relieves the anxiety that students have about why they did, did or did, didn't get in, and it um, punctures the balloon of those who did get in. Right. Right? It, yeah. It, it relieves them of the comforting but um, entirely self-serving illusion that they got in on their own merits. <laughs> um, and it, it defeats the whole legacy. Oh my goodness, I, was, I just looked at the numbers on this. They're so astonishing. Uh, the percent of the, let's stick with Harvard, since I love beating up on Harvard. <laughs> the percent of the Harvard undergraduate population that belongs to either legacy, your parents went to Harvard, Dean's List, your parents have a lot of money, uh, athlete, you were, you're really good at fencing or water polo, and, um, uh, or faculty kid, which is the most defensible of all those. The percentage of kids who belong to one of those four categories and who as a result of belonging to those four categories get a admissions preference that is like this. I mean, standard deviation lower than everybody else. On the Harvard campus is 30%. Mm. If you see a white person on a Harvard campus, there's a 50% chance they belong to one of those four privileged groups. That's, you know, that's absurd. It's just absurd. I agree. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, so, and, and you're absolutely right. We don't track, for example, how well an SAT score correlates with your performance in college in, well, and in we life. Track it in, in life in is life. what I'm interested right. in. Right, yeah. And the reason we don't track it is probably because the correlation is so dismal. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, what was your SAT score? I never, t I'm Canadian, we didn't take it. Oh, you didn't take it, that's right, you're I, Canadian. You know how I yeah. got into college is I, in that era, I literally filled out a one-page form, which I listed the colleges I wanted to do, go to in order. I mailed the form in. My high school mailed my grades in to a kind of central processing facility, which in Canada was probably located somewhere in the distant north. And then I just got a letter in the mail saying, you're going here. I applied up. for college in about five minutes. I don't even think I discussed it with my parents. I think, I think they're just like, you know, Malcolm, come to dinner. And I was like, I'm applying to college. And they're like, <laughs> all, right, all right, we'll see you in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do in college? I, well, I was very young. So I went to, this being Canada. In Canada in the 70s is, uh, an experiment unlikely to be replicated. Um, <laughs> but it was a magical period where there really weren't any rules. And so I never graduated from high school. And my mother was complicit in this. And uh, my feeling was, why, would, why do they care whether I graduated from high school? I mean, I did the courses that I thought would be predictive of kind of college success, and I just skipped the rest. And uh, I was, it turns out, correct, they didn't care. It turns out like it was just like, a, in the 70s in Canada, the notion you had to complete high school in order to attend college was just a story they told you that had no basis <laughs> in fact. So I got there, but I was two years younger than everyone else. It took me a while to get my sea legs, but then I did fine. I enjoyed myself. I didn't like going to, class, <laughs> but, um, but I took my, my studies very seriously. So I really liked, I thought seminars were what college was about. The idea of going to a large lecture seems to be pointless. I can read a book and get it all. But and now you can do it online. Now you can do it. But seminars, I attended, yeah. you know, um, uh, very, I mean, I never missed one. Okay. That was. Ten people in a room with a professor is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our students are spoiled that way because we do have those very small seminars. Um, so staying with that theme, with meritocracy, do you worry about the need for validation that starts at a very early age with kids? And you have very young kids, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but you know, by the time they get to college, I'm smart if I'm admitted into this university. So that's why I like your lottery idea. Mm. And then it's fed even further because if my professor gives me an A, then they're telling me I'm smart. I'm looking for that validation. I'm looking for that feedback. Mm. Uh, you know, rather than me feeling sort of proud of myself and my accomplishments, it's what people tell me yeah. as to whether they're proud of me or not. And it starts with parents. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I started a company, an audio company, with a friend of mine a couple years ago, four or five years ago. So for the first time, I have kind of real world experience with hiring people younger than myself. And, you know, it's really been an eye opener. First of all, I in instituted this policy at our company that we, uh, we cannot, we will not ask and no job applicant uh, can disclose where they went to college. So we've taken that off the table. That's really interesting. And the second thing I've learned is that I'm, the qualities I'm interested in in employees, coworkers, are really about character. Character. That, yeah. you know, most of the people we see are more than capable intellectually of handling the work we're gonna do. It's just, it's just about how enthusiastic are they? Are they, uh, do they, work hard. Uh, do they have how, integrity? Do they have integrity? Are they, re, are they resilient and flexible? And that's really, that's what I care about. And so that's kind of radically, you know, you grow up 
particularly if you are operating in kind of you know, knowledge intensive worlds, as really privileging intelligence as the key variable. And then you get into a kind of real world situation and you realize intelligence is um, widely and generously distributed and that it's character traits that are really kind of, I'm not saying anything new here or radical, but it was a, it was a kind of wake up for me to realize, you know, I, you know, the, the, I have a, someone, I, uh, my assistant at the moment, who is testimony to her character, quit, very quickly realized she didn't really want to be my assistant. She wanted to play a much bigger role at the company and just did it. She started showing up for things, learning stuff on her own, but <laughs> to the point where she sort of ceased being my assistant and became this. And like, that was just all about, she's not smarter than anyone else. She's very smart. Not smarter than anyone else. She's just a go-getter. Right. She's just hungry right. and right. that's fantastic. And there are different kinds of smarts, aren't there? I mean, there's academic smarts, but there are other types of smarts that are very, very important for getting along. But taking that, that notion, um, you know, assuming that everybody who hired did not look at where you studied yeah. or what you studied or what your grades were, yeah. okay? Um, then, I mean, it's sort of a rhetorical question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, what then motivates students as to which college they go to and what they study and that they study? <laughs> yeah. Well, it should be enough as a way of explanation uh, that a student is, a student's motivation is to satisfy their own curiosity. That should be sufficient. Um, that's why you go to college, because you're curious about stuff. Right. You should go to the college where you believe your curiosity can be uh, most readily sa satisfied. And you should study things about which you know the least. Or at least, maybe that's the wrong way of saying it, where the gap between what you want to know and what you know is greatest. Mm -hmm. um, and that's enough, right? right? I mean, I don't think it should be kind of definitive. You know, the, 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 one of the things that I think about a lot, um, and I think is generally underappreciated, is a student today, someone who's 20 in 2023, they're probably going to live, I don't know, well past 100, maybe, a, I, who knows? I mean, their, their lifespan is going to be some multiple of Hours. Hours. Yep. So if you're going to live 120 years and you're now 20, you got 100 more years. <laughs> what, what's the hurry in figuring out what you have to do? Like right. you're operating on a clock that was set in the 19th century when your life expectancy was 50. Mm -hmm. So someone in 1870 said, you're 20, hurry up. It's almost right. over. <laughs> you know, it's not 1870 anymore, yeah. and it's not almost over. Right. So I think people should be, I'm all in favor of people taking a relatively leisurely, if they can, taking a relatively leisurely path uh, towards not working, but settling on work. I don't think people should do nothing. Right. I think they should do stuff, but they don't have to definitively decide what they want to do at a really, really early age. They should. Explore. They right. should, you know, get, take a job even in a field that you have no interest in just to see. You know? But society imposes these pressures, right? So I have my 26 year old nephew who's constantly struggling and he went to Colombia and all of that. You know, what am I going to do with my life? And I'm like, I don't know. You don't know. Take your time, right? As long as you are productive. Is that the right advice? I think that's, I think that is the right advice. Yeah. And, um, you know, I look at my, my mother, for example, who uh, at the age of, I think she was in her early 50s, late 40s, went back to school, got an MSW, and was a therapist for the final, that kind of, for 30 more years. Mm. No, uh, 25 more years. First of all, 25 years is a long time. Um, and secondly, she was a way better therapist in her 50s than she would have been in her 20s. Mm. 
right? Right, she, of course. She had a yeah. benefit of life experience. Yeah. She had a whole, I mean, she, when she looks at her life, there are these kind of, she divided it up into, there was a period when she was this, she was a writer, she was a stay-at-home mom, she was a student, she was a therapist, she was a retiree. And I think, you know, there are f just five stages, she's still alive, five clear stages to her life. And I don't think she thought that her life would have been improved if she had accelerated the transition to that crucial uh, career phase. I think she was fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe she wouldn't have been as good at it if yeah, she had I accelerated so, yeah. it. So on the one hand, we're saying, take your time, figure it out, uh, fail, but fail well, right? And learn from the failure and learn from the success. At the same time this morning, when you were the keynote opening the conference on water uh, security that we're um, having today and tomorrow, you talked about the notion of urgency, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a very different context. Do you want to talk about that and sort of yeah. juxtapose the two themes? <laughs> well, the urgency discussion is really about our, what approach we should take in tackling problems. Um, serious problems and the idea that um, we should be very clear when there is a clock attached to a problem um, and we're not always and the one way to kind of rank um, to prioritize the challenges we're facing is on the urgency dimension and one of the things I was talking a lot about about successful entrepreneurs, one of the things that does distinguish successful entrepreneurs is their ability to understand when a problem is urgent, right? Which piece of this puzzle has to be done now versus, I don't think, that, I don't think as a society we're generally, like I can, you know, all of us can sit around here and make a list of what we think, are, think of as the 10 most urgent issues facing whatever country we're in or whatever. But um, it's a very different matter when you say, okay, rank them in terms of, uh, of, of urgency, of the, what's the time limit on all those 10? It may be that the most urgent is not the most kind of conceptually the most critical. It may be that there are some really serious problems we, we face that it's fine to put them aside for mm -hmm. now, that maybe being patient with them is exactly what they need. Um, it is, it, urgency is a separate dimension, in other words, from the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, conceptual um, seriousness of an issue. Mm. Let's talk about Malcolm, the writer. Did you always know that you wanted to write? Mm. Not really. I mean, I liked writing as a kid. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was a career, um, which is another attitude common to growing up in Canada in the seventies. <laughs> you know, it, it, we the it is comic looking back, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, about just how terrible the economy was in Canada in the seventies. I mean, I realize that now it probably shaped me way more than I, you know, I grew up with an expectation. My father actually said to me when I went to college, said, just be aware of the fact that you probably won't get a job when you graduate. <laughs> he wasn't being, he wasn't expressing um, a lack of optimism about my prospects personally. He was just saying, look, you live in Canada, it's 1984. Things aren't looking good for any of us. <laughs> but, um, you know, so like, uh, I didn't imagine that there was, I thought it was something, it was a fun thing, and I kind of stumbled into it as a, as a career. Um, and I still don't think of myself as a writer-writer. I think of myself as a journalist, which is a very different, I'm someone who does reporting on subjects. The fact that I'm, I then write up what I learn, it seems to me secondary to the fact, a writer, when, I, when you use the word writer, I think of someone you know, in a lonely cabin somewhere, emptying the contents of their mind on the page. Right. That is just not what I do. You observe life, you chronicle. You most, think. Of what I, most of what I do is, you know, if I divide up my working day, 
uh, writing is only a tiny portion of it. I spend most of my time researching and mm. interviewing people and... Um, yeah. You've been described as a democratizer of academic and complicated concepts. Um, and in the preface of What the Dog So, you wrote, which really resonated with me, good writing, just to go back to the writing theme for a second, does not succeed or fail on the strength of its ability to persuade. It succeeds or fails on the strength of its ability to engage you, to make you think, to give you a glimpse into someone else's head. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and about the process of democratizing complicated concepts, unpacking them, breaking yeah. them down, let people think and make their own conclusions? Well, there's a, to use the language of economists, there is a, uh, a, a market, um, wait, what's the phrase I wanted to, I can't find it right now, but um, you know, every, every, every business tries to find a, uh, a, a marketplace abnormality to exploit. The uh, marketplace abnormality that I try to, or dysfunction I try to, dis, I try to exploit is that academics have a ton of good ideas, but by virtue of being academics, they don't have the opportunity to democratize them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, you have a, there's a market failure. Um, and so I have stepped into the market failure and said, I'll do that for you um, quite happily. I sometimes describe myself as the, you know, the, how elephants had those little birds that sit on their back and peck the, mm. the gnats off the back of the elephant. I'm that bird, that's what I do. And we need you. <laughs> uh, yeah, the elephant is very happy to have the bird, usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, occasionally it's annoying, but um, so that's the kind of um, way I see what I'm doing. I'm the kind of middleman between these two, um, between these two roles. Yeah. I think that's to these two um, communities. Yeah. Academics are typically not interested in communicating their ideas, making them accessible or democratizing them. I mean, that's a general, uh, maybe a sweeping statement, but I know from my publisher, an academic publisher, uh, gets tickled when there is an author who's actually interested in marketing their book. You know, he tells me most academics that he works with just want to publish the book. And mm. if a hundred other academics read it, then it's a success. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's, a re there's several reasons for that. Some of them are institutional. Some of them are kind of psychological. The institutional reason, two institutional reasons come to mind. One is that um, if you're an academic, you can't, you know, publicizing a book these days, if you really want to do it properly, is, takes an enormous amount of time. You can't ask someone who's teaching three courses to go on a six-month book tour. I have gone on six-month book tours before, right? Uh, the other reason is that um, there are a series of compromises that are necessary to take an academic idea and make it popular. Mm. Um, they are necessary compromises, but they are difficult. You do need to, um, to kind of prune the idea, prune some of its complexity, prune. Now, this is why I, you know, the most common complaint I get from critics is that I am an an, uh, uh, an, that I oversimplify things, um, to which I plead guilty. Of course I do. I mean, if I didn't. You wear I, that as a badge of honor, right? Yeah. I mean, if I didn't, I wouldn't be selling any yeah. books, and you wouldn't yeah. be talking about me at all. Uh, you have to. And you also have to decide which ideas work in a public realm. Um, mm. You know, I was at lunch, I was chatting about something I'm working on now. The version that I gave you at lunch is not the version that'll be in the book. The book, I can't do, what I did at lunch was for academics. You can't, I, you can't reproduce that in a book that you want to sell to the general public. I'm not dissing the general public by saying that. I'm just saying it just doesn't, there's a degree of complexity that you cannot engage if you want to write a popular book. You'll just lose people. And like, it is, appropriately very difficult for academics to make that, to compromise in that way. 
It's just not, if you could, if you were, if, if you were willing to compromise, why would you be an academic? The whole point about academic research is that it's uncompromising. The rigor. You, yeah, yeah you, you, we want you to pursue the truth in as much, with as much kind of rigor as you possibly can. But I, journalists, are compromisers, right? We, I started my career at a newspaper. The, I, there was a time compromise. I would get an assignment at two in the morning, at two in the afternoon, and I would have to produce a story by six or 5.30. Like, if you have to do something in three and a half hours, you compromise. It's baked into the, right? So there's a, these are, prof, there are huge professional differences between sure, sure. these two realms. But those are two different things, right? I mean, you know, doing a story in three and a half hours is very different than taking important academic results, right? You know, findings and then translating them as you as you do. And you pour over research material. You read a lot. You try to understand it. You connect uh, with people to help you understand it, I assume. Mm. Um, so that's a very different kind of role. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, and it's also incredibly fun. You know, in the book I'm writing now, um, I have a whole chapter on COVID and how uh, uh, we really weren't, I don't mean this in a conspiratorial way, the stuff that we were told during the pandemic, a lot of it just wasn't true. And it wasn't true because of this very problem that we're talking about, that a lot of the, of what scientists believed about what was happening was that conversation was taking place in their world and not in the larger world. And the gap just wasn't bridged. So it's like, it's really weird. Like you go back and you read what they were saying to each other and they were just having a different conversation. It's kind of, you're like, wait a second, right? I guess, and I guess journalists were so overwhelmed with doing what they were doing that they just never took the time to kind of translate. So for, we went three years with having this public conversation and then the private scientific conversation, which was just like completely different. It's the weirdest, one of the weirdest <laughs> phenomenon I've ever. Uh, so what impact did that have on us? I mean, I, listening to you, it makes me think that we just trusted the science and followed and did what they told us to do. Well, you know, so this is about things like what is, what is uh, about transmission risk? Right. So we were all told during the pandemic to proceed on the understanding that each of us had a relatively, roughly equal potential risk of transmitting the virus to someone else should we be infected. Right? It's just not true. I mean, it's just so completely 100% massively not true. It's insanely not true. If in this room right now, there are probably three people who, if infected, would have a reasonable risk of passing on the virus to someone else, and the rest of you just wouldn't matter. They, did they tell us that? No. Why did they tell us that? Well, it's hard to figure out who that three people are, so maybe it's just easier just to pretend everyone's. Mm. Uh, and also, if we do know who the three people are, it's really kind of, it's tricky to kind of point a finger at them. Right? How do you do that? Do I, if I knew who the, who the three of you were, and this is in the middle of the pandemic, would I be justified in saying you can't come in? Nobody really wanted to have that conversation. Right. So we didn't have it. And how would I identify you? And how would you identify yourself? And yeah, yeah. makes sense. Um, now, you're working on the sequel to The Tipping Point. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I made the mistake of rereading it. <laughs> and <laughs> you should never revisit anything you did 25 years ago. This is a general rule. <laughs> you shouldn't listen to the music you listened to 25 years ago. You shouldn't look at pictures of yourself from 25 really? years ago. Um, and but you you do, sorry, but you do that with the revisionist history, your podcast. Other people's past, not Ah, mine. not yeah, your yeah, own. Yeah. Okay. It's very personal here. <laughs> okay. And you should definitely never read anything you wrote 25 years ago. So I, like I said, made the mistake of rereading. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> so I decided I would redo it. And then 
Originally, I was just going to fix it up and re-release it on its 25th anniversary. And then I was like, that's lame. I should just do a new one. So I did a new one. I'm mostly done. Um, and it will come out next year. It's basically just kind of using the same template of the epidemic and the language of epidemiology. But I'm exploring new dimensions of that idea. And I'm using new examples. Um, and I'm intrigued by the possibility, the idea that the nature of the epidemics we face is very different today than they were 25 years ago. That a lot of the processes I was describing in the tipping point have been kind of ramped up, accelerated. Mm. And that that's really what's one of the things that's distinctive about the age we're living in is, um, so for example, the opening chapter is a comparison of uh, contemporary bank robbing to historical bank robbing. Um, bank remember? robbing. Pardon me? Bank robbing, you said. Yeah, robbing okay. of banks. So, <laughs> in the... You're going to tell us what was wrong in the way that they used to do it and yeah. how to do it right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the old school bank robber has a gun, has maybe an accomplice, goes into a bank, says, everybody get down. You know, gets someone to open the safe, stuffs cash into pillowcases, runs out of the bank. Right. Now, the effects of that, they could make off with quite a lot of money, but no bank robbery has ever imperiled a bank. Right? No bank has ever gone out of business, except in the Old West. But no modern bank went out of business because somebody robbed a branch somewhere in. Uh, when a bank is robbed, the kind of collateral damage is limited. It doesn't, people don't, aren't fired from the firm. There isn't some, you go down the list. It is a, bank robberies, traditional ones, are epidemics. They're clearly contagious phenomenon. You have outbreaks of bank robberies in cities that follow an exact epidemic curve. Really? Oh yeah, it's very, it's a contagious behavior. One criminal observes another criminal making a lot of money you know, for like three minutes work and says, how did I overlook this as a source of possible income? Um, but the, it's an epidemic on a relatively small scale. Okay, so what, are, what does a modern bank robbery look like? Well, remember the, bank of Bang, the, bank, the Bangladeshi bank heist of four years ago, five years ago, where they almost made off with a billion now, and they only didn't because of an incredibly, unbelievably unlikely bit of misfortune. But had they made off with a billion, that would have had a material impact on the city, on the country of Bangladesh. Um, and also the money that was used, that was taken from the Bangladeshi bank, was used to fund North Korea's nuclear program. So this is a heist with unbelievably significant international ramifications. It is a heist that actually directly fueled, you know, international instability, right? I mean, it's a whole different, and is, was the Bank of Bangladesh heist a epidemic phenomenon? Totally, you look at the number of cyber crimes since that heist, and it goes up like that. It's an epidemic curve. Every, every would-be hacker around the country, around the world, looks at the fact that it's like, they almost got a billion for that? Like, I'm in, right? Um, but now, the epidemic imperils us, you know, whereas before the epidemic was a kind of inconvenience. If you happened to be in a branch at that time, you just, you know, sprawled on the floor and maybe they took your wedding ring. That was like the extent of it. Um, that's an interesting... And it's much more global because the old way of doing global. it is very local. Yeah. Gone from local to global, gone from, you know, amount of money stolen has gone up several orders of magnitude. Uh, ramifications have gone from minimal to massive. You know, I could go on and on and on. Now, the, so the interesting question is, is that a kind of, is that example um, a, uh, a kind of metaphor for what's going on all over the place now? Is that what it means to live in the 21st century, that somehow these social processes have been turbocharged in that way? That's sort of what I'm interested in. 
and we'll have to wait well, and read it. Wait, read it. Okay. okay. <laughs> what is it like to live in the twenty first century? What is it like? Yeah. I mean, how do you? How would you characterize it? How would you capture it? Well, I don't think that um, anything has happened yet. By which I mean, if we woke up and it was 1999, it would take us a while to figure out that it was 1999. In other words, our life would proceed. We would realize, oh, I don't have a cell phone. The internet's kind of a vague idea. But like, a lot of what we do it's not fundamentally different from what we do now. In fact, I would strongly argue that we were all happier in 1999 than we are in 2023. It's a better time. Um, but I strongly suspect that very soon the gap between 1999 and the present day is going to be enormous. In other words, a lot of the discontinuities that characterize the 21st century haven't happened yet. Um, you know, uh, the, the, for some reason, I don't know why, the event of the last, of all the horrible things that have happened in the last couple of months, the one that struck me as being potentially, or at least the most unremarked upon, was this hurricane in, that hit Acapulco. It seemed it's phenomenal. It's kind of like, basically wipes out Acapulco. And it develops into a Category 5 in way less time than we're used to. It's only a miracle that lots and lots of people didn't die. Mm. But they're going to spend years rebuilding what was a viable. If that starts to happen a lot, what happens if that same storm hits Miami? That's like a radical discontinuity with okay. past, right? Now you start adding into that, you know, a in 1999, there was no realistic possibility of, excuse me, some kind of uh, uh, really troubling and biological warfare attack. I mean, it, it was out there, but not a kind of weaponized, custom-made thing. We're getting very close to that with CRISPR, that someone could do something really nasty. Uh, I could sort of go down the list. It's strange to me that there, is the, there are these kind of, there is a kind of technological, and then there's also on the plus side things like, you're all going to live to 120. That, in 1999, we didn't imagine that. Right. Um, so I just sort of think the 21st century hasn't kicked in yet. So it's continuities, climate, biological warfare, nuclear. But also on the plus side, yeah. medical advances. Yeah. Uh, uh, other, you know, electric everything, AI, I mean, all these kinds of things. That's the, the AI, the AI, AI punch or jump or what do you want to call it, hasn't happened yet. It's, it's going to happen. I don't know what it looks like, but it's going to be pretty significant, I think. Yeah. Sure, there'll be questions from the audience on that. Before I turn it to the audience, just one other theme, if I may explore with you. And borrows from a number of your books, but maybe talking to strangers. Um, and that is the, um, at a time when the world is multipolar, uh, very polarized uh, at the micro level, you know, within countries, at the macro level, across the world. Um, how, you know, and, and you've been an astute observer of human nature and human behavior. Um, so when minds are closed, uh, you talk about listening, engaging, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we try to do with our students in this kind of a um, community and setting. Um, and you talk about, if I, if I understood correctly, that to really listen, I mean, to really understand the person and to be able to engage with them, you need to listen and you need to understand their context, right? Because we often impose our context and try to, you know, I try to read you based on my mm. view of the world. Um, so how do we train our minds to remain open uh, to the possibility of changing our mm. minds, of engaging, of becoming perhaps 
less polarized, um, to listening better. What advice would you give well, us? Well, I'm going to give a boring answer. Uh, and the boring answer is, you know, historically, this is the function that travel served. Mm. And I, when I say travel, I don't just mean tourism, but, uh, you know, when I think about my parents, who are both immigrants, double immigrants, moved twice from their home countries, um, that in their, for their generation, for their, not, yeah, for, the, for their peers in the two countries where they grew up, um, that's what it meant to engage with the world, was to leave, leave where you were from, mm. right? Mm. The, you know, it was a very sort of self-conscious understanding that um, you can't do it if you stay, all, if you stay in the same place. Right. Um, and you have to be willing uh, to experience and endure the discomfort, physical and psychological, that comes from leaving where you're from. But that's kind of necessary part of what it means to be human. Um, and I really worry that that impulse has, is disappearing and that what tra the form that travel takes now is simply the reproduction of the environment that you left. That it is now possible to move from, you know, uh, New York to Paris and really live exactly the same life. Right, because right. you can now. Yeah. yeah, you can do that now. You can, yeah. you even can, to Doha, you can, you know. Yeah, you can, and it's that. That's not travel. That's yeah. not actually doing what we right. want. We really want. So I'm, you know, I'm wondering whether a lot of this has to do with can we need to perhaps rebuild from the ground up cultural mechanisms for real uh, uh, for exposure to real difference right. to things. You know, is that. I don't know what that is. Is that like, you know, in the day, you know, that's what the army was. We don't really do that anymore, but, um, but it served that kind of function. Um, or, you know, the Peace Corps. Or um, I really think it's tragic if a college student doesn't spend at least a year uh, at some place other than the college they signed up for. What's, mm. Like at that age, why would you? Why wouldn't you want to put everything you believe to the test? Like, what, you've really made up your mind about life at 19? I mean, at 19, you should, at 19, you should be doing something that causes you embarrassment later in life. That's, that's the whole point of being 19, right? <laughs> we were talking lunch about how I regret not going to the Marxist college at the University of Toronto. I totally do. <laughs> what a wasted opportunity. That was my one chance to be a Marxist. And I threw it away <laughs> because I was so interested in you know, sticking to the tried and true. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is when you're 40 and 50, when somebody asks you, tell me about the most important embarrassing moment of your youth and you have nothing to say. You gotta have, I do have many, yeah. as it turns out, embarrassing moments. Tell but, us um, one. What's that? Tell us one or two. Well, I went in, the, actually at that age, I went in the other direction and I was a total right winger. I had a picture of Ronald Reagan on my dorm, on my- uh, okay. This interview coach. is over. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, uh, well, because in Canada in 1983, there, there's just no, you can't move, there's no room on the left. You can't go, you can't, you can't out left the left. The left is so left at that point. The only room for rebellion is on the right. So I was like, all right, <laughs> let's, let's do that. So it's, you know, let's go against the trend, right? Everyone's yeah, going let's left. Go, let's yeah. be, you know, so I was a good Reaganite and I did my, you know, didn't last very long, but it was actually quite fun in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how long did it last? What changed it? Well, no girl will date you in Canada if you're <laughs> if you're a Reaganite Republican in 1984. So that was a powerful corrective. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anything else embarrassing you'd like to share? That's probably embarrassing enough. That's, that's embarrassing enough. You want to stop there.
Okay, thank you. I mean, this is great. And uh, if I wanted to be selfish, I would just continue the conversation here. But let's hear from you. How are we doing it? We have people with microphones. So raise your hands. And let's start. Okay, so I'm going to, one, the woman here. Yeah, second row. Then I'm going to try to be geographically diverse, okay? And then come back and make another round, okay? Thank you so much um, to Georgetown and to Mr. Gladwell for joining us. Um, you mentioned uh, innovators. You talked about innovators at length in, in all of your books. And so what should an innovator do that doesn't have a Xerox lab? It's my question, because you talked about how Steve Jobs went to the Xerox lab, saw what they were doing, went home, and totally changed everything. That's how we have Apple, uh, the Apple as we know it now. So for all of the innovators, myself and the other young people in the audience, um, that don't have the advantage of a Xerox lab or Xerox funding, what mm -hmm. do you suggest that we do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of, I, this is a reference to a story I told this morning at the talk I gave about Steve Jobs going to this famous research lab in Silicon Valley and, and getting the idea that sparked him on his kind of journey. Um, a lot of that is about uh, that there was a kind of de facto creative community in Silicon Valley. There were enough people who were obsessed with the same thing that there was a kind of um, easy way to interact and learn from people who uh, who shared your obsessions, right? And I think it's very, very hard to find um, any uh, historical evidence of a new or revolutionary or innovative movement that didn't have a, didn't come with a community. Everyone always comes with a community. And, you know, the first, so the first question I, that would be innovators should ask themselves is, where is my community? And uh, if you can locate one that makes sense to you, you should go there, right? It's really hard, I think, to kind of be a kind of lone figure. Um, the, the trick is to understand that community can take all kinds of different forms. It may not be the case that you want people who are doing exactly what you do. You just need people who will inspire you and teach you. Um, but I do think that has to be the first question, is where do I belong when I, before I start on this kind of journey? Great. Second row. Of, yeah. uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Malcolm Gladwell. I'm very happy that uh, you chose, uh, you joined us today. And uh, I'm a bit shaky because I've read your books and your articles, and it's just uh, very uh, interesting for me to meet you finally. Uh, my question is, so in the outliers, you talk about different factors that are outside of your control that contribute to your success. So how would you uh, advise people to identify those advantages that they have and make best use of them? Yeah. Like what is the right way? How do we know what, what are the advantages that we have? and how we make best use of them. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a really good question. I'm not sure we always do know or can know. I think a lot of, first of all, a lot of these things become evident to us only in hindsight. And two, that um, an advantage, something that's an advantage to you might not be an advantage to someone else. In other words, I think that what constitu constitutes an advantage is an interaction between a context and a person. Some of those interactions are very clear. You know, it, if you want to be a great, there's a, you know, uh, uh, there are times and places where I'm, I'm a big runner. Right now, an insane number of really great runners seem to come from this one corner of Norway. One, it's Ingebrigtsen's Jakob Ingebrigtsen's father is this kind of coach who has all these great ideas. You know, that's an obvious advantage. You want to move to Norway and train under him, you probably get a leg up. 
that's not a necessarily interaction. That's a kind of, but others are more, a lot more kind of complicated and dependent on the person. In my book, David and Goliath, I talk about how dyslexia for most people is a disadvantage. For a small number of people is a huge advantage. Um, it depends, depends on your level of other um, abilities and, um, and also to the people, for the people for whom it was an advantage. It, it only, they were only clear that it was an advantage much later on. When they were in the moment, it seemed like it was a burden. Um, so it's a very, that's not an easy thing to answer, I'm afraid. Daniel, there was a hand up here. Yes, please. I'll go back up. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for both of you. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I have a question for you, Mr. Gladwell. Uh, when it comes to social media, given how easy it is to publish, publish misinformation, do you think social media hinders or helps democratization of ideas, and how? Uh, that's another good question. Um, well, I will say, before I go any further, that it's always been easy to publish false and not easy. There's always been a great deal of false and misleading ideas out there. Um, I would encourage you to go back and look at archives of newspapers from, you know, southern towns in the United States in the 1950s, and you'll see a lot of false ideas. Um, so, like, we're not, we're not, it's not, that's not new in our, in this regard. The other thing I would say, the second thing I would say is that the effects of social media are, uh, we have to understand how young this particular medium is. It's very hard to, uh, to, to diagnose the strengths and weaknesses of a uh, media platform when it's in its infancy. And it really is, you know, all these things, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they're all in their infancy. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, they've barely been around at all. And I think a lot of them are going through a kind of period of growing pains. Um, when I look at, for example, the way that I use Twitter, it has radically changed over the course of the last five years. I've gotten way more kind of selective. Uh, the reason I read it is now different from the reason I read it in the past. I know what I want and I, so I'm learning, and I think that's sort of true of many people. We're all learning how to navigate these spaces in a way that minimizes the downside. And so I would, I'm not sure that the way the ef social effects that social media has today are the same as the effects it'll have 20 years from now, um, or 10 years from now. I'm also not clear that, I think that uh, we were very naive about the problems these, um, technologies phase, uh, pose for children. And I think, you know, I think uh, we'll get, be a lot smarter about that a couple years down the road. And that'll really change things, you know, when, um, if we manage to kind of successfully limit uh, the use of social media by kids, that removes a lot of what's bad about social media. Um, so I, 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 my, 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 my answer is wait and see. It just seems really early to draw conclusions about it. But the idea that misinformation always existed, and you refer to like papers in the 1950s, 60s, it's just that they didn't, misinformation didn't travel as fast or as widely around the globe as it does today with social media, mm. right? I mean, that's my distaste for social media is predicated on that. Yeah, although, yes, but I would say two things that, one is that we're certainly aware much more quickly and accurately of how far it's traveling on the world. Um, but I don't know, that doesn't mean that it wasn't traveling around the world before, just in a way that didn't catch our attention. Right. Um, and secondly, that there is a self-correcting market mechanism with social media, which is that the more of it there is, the less powerful. Mm. Um, someone told me recently, do you know how many, that within the next couple of years, we will reach a point where there are 
a million songs released, pop songs, released every day. We're now at a million a week. We'll wow. soon be at a million a day. When you have a million pop songs released every day, the individual importance of any one pop song gets really small. Mm. So pop kind of, by virtue of the sheer volume of it, starts to cancel itself sure. out. Um, sure. And I wonder whether the same is increasingly true of, I mean, Twitter's just overwhelming. Yeah. yeah I, the only people I follow on Twitter now are like right. military logistics nerds who write <laughs> long <laughs> posts about Ukraine that are just fantastic. Like, right. you know. WhatsApp is outdated. I mean, kids laugh at us when we say we use WhatsApp or Instagram or any of yeah. those. So they do you become, use WhatsApp? Do you? I do, yeah. <laughs> 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 what do you use? <laughs> Like, you know, I don't use it. Don't okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moved on. <laughs> Any questions from the back? Yes, let's take a couple from the back because I don't want to miss you. Um, I want to go back to the theme of education. Um, I'm fascinated by praxis and I wanted to hear your thoughts around that. What differentiates people who know from the people who do things? Is there a certain characteristic or a certain element that makes people act on the knowledge they have. Can you say the beginning of that? Sorry, I was looking over there. I didn't realize you were over there. I, say the <laughs> beginning of that, of that question again. Um, I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts about praxis and what separates people who know from people who do. So someone might know something and might not necessarily act on it. Is there a characteristic uh, or something that might cause that shift? Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't really know if I know the answer. Uh, the, yeah, that's, I've never sort of thought about it in exactly, that, in exactly that way. I mean, I suppose this is not an answer to your question, but I've recently become, I'm sort of really curious about the role that just energy plays in something like that. I mean, when you look at like across, you know, uh, a, a, a broad group of people, the variation in how much people, how much energy people have just to do stuff is enormous. Mm. It's like, did you ever read those profiles of some CEO and they'll always say, they rise at 3.45, <laughs> they're in the gym till like 5.30, then they read six newspapers. You don't do that. Do you do that? What's that? Do you do that? No. no, no. <laughs> but like, part of me, I would read those all the time and I would think, hey, guy's totally making it up. And then I realized, <laughs> no, no, he's not making it up. There are legit people who, you know, rise at 345 and go to the gym for an hour and a half and then read six newspapers, have a strong cup of coffee, you know, do push-ups. Works for go. them. <laughs> What's that? It works for them. It works for them. <laughs> and like... <laughs> That, that person gets a lot more done in the day than I do. There's just no question about that. And maybe is it as simple as that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is that like, maybe what people who kind of are simply kind of dreamers, what keeps them as dreamers is they just run out of time at the end of the day. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer. Are you sure about that? I mean, I think, does it, do you have to get up at 3.45 in the morning no, in order to accomplish so much during the day? I mean, I read a book, uh, Taoism, on, on, on leadership, right? And there are many people who sort of, you know, want to demonstrate how busy they are. And they craft the schedule and they wake up very, very early to send signals that they really are very serious about their work. And mm. that's, you know, misleading in many respects. In, in some cases, but there are yeah. legit people who achieve astonishing amounts. Yeah, yeah. I'm friends with this, uh, with Adam Grant, the kind of psychologist at Penn. Adam, I don't know, I mean, I wanna, at some point if I have the energy, would like to follow him around for a week. <laughs> I have no idea how he does all the things he does. It just blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, he's clearly, so he's one of those people. I don't know, yeah. I'm sort of very curious about them. Yeah. Somebody from the middle in the back? There, second row. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gladwell and uh, Dean Mustry. Really appreciate this. 
from another Canadian who comes from 1970s Canada. I love the flashbacks, so thank you so much. Uh, I have a question about the relevance of colleges and universities. I know you started off talking about not being able to predict the future, and so I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. But in light of the emergence of AI and the challenges that that seems to be presenting, and also in light of your role in democratizing academic knowledge, which I think is very appreciated, obviously, in, in the New York bestseller lists, what role do you see in the next five to 10 years um, post-secondary institutions taking in terms of perhaps closing that gap, mediating the challenges that new technology are giving us in terms of the youth outsourcing their thinking to algorithms? Mm. What, well, what role can we play? So before, before you answer that, let me just make a statement here. I think as a result of this conversation, I'm ready to propose to my faculty that we do away with grades, okay? We do away with admissions requirements, we do away with majors, but I don't think I want to propose to them that we close down the college. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't no, going there, thank you. <laughs> no, I don't, you know, I think you can make as strong an argument for the university being more relevant in the age of AI than you can that it's less relevant. In any kind of major, so we're clearly headed towards a relatively significant um, disruption in the way a lot of professions do their jobs and the way society functions as a result of AI. Whenever you see a disruption, there is a kind of massive uh, reorientation and re-education task that needs to be done. And the natural place for, for that task to be done is colleges, if they're up for the, universities, if they're up for the challenge. Um, think about uh, the way, let's just pick up random medicine. So what happens when AI comes along to medicine? Well, you can imagine that a huge chunk of the cognitive work of being a doctor moves to AI, and what the doctor is left with is equally, if not more important stuff, that's about relating to patients, understanding them, reassuring them, helping them navigate the system. How do you take a group of the existing uh, group of medical professions who grew up under the old paradigm to work in the new paradigm, right? Well, do they have to come back to school in some form? Probably. Um, who, where is a natural place for them to go back to school? Well, it's in the schools we already have. Now, they need to kind of reconfigure to take on that new task. But like, that's an extraordinarily important task that is naturally situated here, right? Or think about, suppose you wanted to uh, redesign medical education, med school, in the age of AI. Google and Apple and whatever would desperately love to do that for you, for us, right? I think it's kind of important that they not. Um, that it be done by some body that has a degree of, of intellectual independence from commercial interests, that's doing something that's uh, designed to serve us and not serve the bottom line of it. What's that body? It's this, right? It better happen here, because I don't, I, don't I don't want you to go to the med school of Google, which is just gonna be med school oriented around servicing Google algorithms, right? Um, so, you know, I could go down the list on things like that and come up with all kinds of new functions that I wanna take place in these four walls and not somewhere else. Um, if you're, if we're all gonna, not if you're all gonna, not me, I'm too old, but if the 20 year old of today is gonna live to 120, then doesn't that mean that they could afford or maybe need to spend way more time in school um, than they have in the past, right? What if, what if six years of undergraduate spread over the first 30 years of your career is the, is, makes more sense, or eight years of undergraduate spread over 30 years makes more sense. Where's that gonna take place? It's gonna take place here. 
right? Um, I mean, I could, we could go on and on and on and on and on. I don't, so I think that, uh, that even a little bit of sort of investigation of what the future might look like um, leads you back to this incredibly flexible thing um, uh, called a university, which you know is unique among social institutions in that it, I think it has the ability to kind of adapt to these new roles. Remember 20 years ago when MOOCs were going to replace universities, the mass online courses, right? That didn't happen. What has succeeded is the stuff that you referred to earlier in terms of the lecture style yeah. courses, math. Right? I mean, that's what the Khan Academy has done very well, has democratized education in math, in okay. um, science and engineering. But the seminar stuff, you need to be in the classroom. And I think there are ways for us to embrace AI, to enhance the education, as Malcolm was saying. OK, there's one there. And then I'm going to make the round back down here. I have the three hands. We have time for you know, a couple of questions. So yes, there was one there in the middle. I know some students have to go to class, so. <laughs> I was wondering if as a market failure expert, you have given any thought to American diplomacy in the Middle East in this region, uh, whether it's the inefficient allocation of property rights going back to Sykes-Picot or the Balfour Declaration or Security Council Resolution 242, I'm, on most people's mind here is probably the conflict in Gaza. To what extent have you thought about legal theorems, law and economics, Ronald Coase? What does the theory say about what's happening, and how could that guide and inform people to reach a solution? Yeah, uh, I mean, I haven't thought about that at all. Um, I'm, this is not an area of my particular specialty. I will only say that. You know, the, I'll always remember, was I, I, whether I listened to it or read it, I can't remember, but I will always remember what was said. Um, after 9-11, in the 9-11 Commission, there was a moment when, uh, what was his name? It was a guy who was number two at the CIA and ran the NSA for a while. He was a kind of eminence emin grise of <clears throat> the American foreign policy and intelligence establishment. He testifies before Congress after 9-11. And Congress asks him, what do you want? What do you think we need to prevent the next catastrophe like this? And they're expecting him to say, I want you know, $50 billion over. I want more satellites. I want this, I want that. And what he said was, I want uh, a better State Department. And what he meant was, I want more smart people who know the culture and history of our allies and adversaries who can give me real advice about what I should be doing, as opposed to kind of advice based on some kind of narrow expedient. I thought it was really an interesting moment um, in which he was really saying the, this traditional structure we set up about people with deep knowledge of regions advising policymakers in times of crisis is something that we have neglected and we need to restore. And um, you know, I thought I, th I thought of that as the kind of Gaza thing has unfolded. That um, it is this enormously complicated issue with very very deep historical antecedents, and a lot of the people who are making decisions around it right now just are don't have the necessary depth, um, and you know, that's a problem, right? Um, and you know the uh, maybe that's kind of the first way we address our shortcomings in this area is to kind of shore up that um, that kind of uh, intellectual inf infrastructure for some of our decision makers. Please, and I'll take one more over there, and then yeah. Um, I am indeed uh, glad and well that I have came today and listened to your insightful uh, thoughts, the erudite Gladwell. 
uh, my question is regarding, uh, have you thought about writing on your short experiences in Qatar when you go back home? Yeah. And what would be the theme or themes of your writing if you have thought about it? Wow. In the 12 hours you've been here. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's a good question. I think I have to wait for a longer trip. Uh, I, have, I've, I haven't seen nearly enough. I mean, I've seen enough to have enjoyed myself, but not enough to have anything uh, new to say. Um, uh, so uh, I wish I'm a track fan. I wish I'd come here for the World Championships. That would have been, I would have something to say about that. But. OK, so I'll, I'll take the two questions there. Uh, okay, Haram, yes, you've had your hand up from the beginning. So we'll take one here and the two there, OK? In whatever order, whoever can get the microphone faster. Thank you. And Yaz, then two gentlemen there. Hi, Mr. Gladwell. Um, I particularly enjoyed your use of terminology in regards to intellectual independence to a previous question. Um, as an aspiring journalist myself, I was wondering what your opinions on the concept of um, unbiased journalism is, and if you think, as human beings, we're capable of that. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think we're capable of, um, let's see, it's an interesting, I, I do mourn the loss of a certain kind of objectivity in the news media. And I think there's a difference between um, bias and uh, uh, subjectivity. That um, all of us have our biases, which we carry around with us, and which are, are an integral part of the way we make sense of the world. But we can ask people in a professional concept, context to be objective. And what that means is to adhere to a certain set of standards about how they are constructing the stories they write. Talk to both sides. Uh, avoid prejudicial language. Uh, you know, we can go down the list. And I think what people have done is to assume that because we are necessarily biased in the way we see the world, we can't be objective. Well, that's true. I think you can be objective, even if you're, you know, the, we ask all kinds of professions to separate their personal biases from their professional, um, you know, doctors, we assume that a doctor is not letting his or her personal biases affect the recommendations they give you for what's ever wrong with you, right? What if a, if a doctor thinks that you're unattractive? They don't give you bad medical advice. No, they take the little part of them that says, ooh, they put that away, <laughs> and they tell you, you've, you've had a heart attack. Here's how I'm going to solve the problem, right? None of us have any issue with, oh, yeah, the doctor can simultaneously be a human being who has a personal reaction to you, and a professional who says you've had a heart attack, <laughs> right? Well, journalists could do the same thing. And it's, it's, it, it pains me to see that people some have given up on the notion that a journalist can, um, can exercise that kind of objective uh, perspective. It's a pleasure to see you uh, in person. Um, I have a couple of short questions. One, today morning you spoke about urgency that entrepreneurs have and the ability to be disagreeable. What's your urgency? And do you see yourself as disagreeable? Because a lot of your ideas uh, in the larger context of how we see uh, work and culture are a little radical. I mean, I don't know whether they are easily acceptable by all. So do you see yourself as disagreeable? Also, secondly, when you write a book, do you write it to be, to, for yourself to be heard or for people to understand a particular point of view that you want to put across? Yeah. Um, both good questions. Uh, what is my um, urgency? Well, I mean, I'm old, so. Uh, I have the urgency of the old. Uh, the clock's running on me. Um, but um, the, with my books, um, I mean, I'm, f my 
I am first and foremost, I suppose, I mean, I think of myself as a journalist. I am a, principally, uh, I am a storyteller. Um, I believe very strongly in the power and the relevance of stories. And I believe that stories is how you reach people and engage with them. And um, that's what matters to me. Um, I always tell the story of, um, I was once in a, uh, a coffee shop in a very fancy part of Houston, Texas. And a woman pulls up in a big fancy Range Rover with like the hair and the pearls, one of those kind of super wealthy Texans, Houstonian. She comes up, she sees me, she comes over to me and says, I have, are you Mr. Gladwell? Oh yes, she said, I have read everything you've written and I disagree with everything you say. <laughs> and I, I just thought, first of all, I was just like, that is the greatest thing anyone has ever said to me. <laughs> and I felt like I have succeeded, right? That's what I want. I, she engaged with me, and she keeps engaging with me, even though she hates what exactly. I'm saying. Exactly, she keeps reading It's fantastic. Again. It's like, that's the gold standard. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> um, you almost don't want this to end, but thank you. This has been so incredibly delightful, and I'm so, so happy that you have shared this afternoon with us, Malcolm. It's always a great pleasure, and thank you. Thank you on behalf of everyone, and thank you.